Um, yeah, and um, okay, so I let the Hessian just be denoted um, DIJ. Uh, okay, so um, we can take lattices in, in the tangent bundle and co tangent bundle um, and pass to a quotient so that we have torus vibrations over this ball. Um, so I'm going to call those torus vibrations X and X check. Um, and each of them emit a Calabi Yau structure. So the Calabi Yau structure is there's going to be a natural metric on um, X just coming from phi, which you know is non-degenerate because we chose it to be a strictly convex function. Um, there's a corresponding Kähler form. Um, and this top dimensional holomorphic volume form. Um, so yeah, if you're not familiar at all with Calabi Yaus, I mean you can sort of take this to be like a pretty good model of, you know, just to give you an intuition. And um, yeah, the the fact that it's Calabi Yau has to do with the fact that phi solves the Marjan pair equation. Okay, so that's on X. And then you can use uh, the, the genre transform to get new coordinates on the base, which I'm going to call little x check. Um, and this notation with the upper ij will be the inverse metric. Uh, so now on x check, we also have a Calabi Yau structure um, with a metric, uh, similarly a corresponding Kähler form, and a homomorphic volume form. So you do the same thing on both sides. Um, and what you can notice is that um, this omega check ends up, so remember omega check right here was the Kähler form on X check, but it's on X, it's, I mean, with respect to the base coordinates, uh, the original coordinate base coordinates on X, it's the natural symplectic form. Um, so similarly, omega, which was the Kähler metric on X, if you use the coordinates on X check, you get the, natural symplectic form there. So in a way, like if you change from X to X check, it swaps what you consider the natural symplectic and complex structure. So, um, so this is more or less like the baby mirror symmetry picture of swapping symplectic and complex structures. Um, and if you want to work on something a little more general than just a ball in RN, um, you can have a base that's an affine manifold with transition functions that are locally constant. Um, the SLNR preserves the uh, determinant equaling one of the modern pair equation, and you can patch together a manifold that way. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, so just a little bit more background then. Um, so if you project onto the base in each space, um, the fibers over any point in the base will be a torus, and these fibers are Lagrangian, which is a condition that means if you restrict the symplectic form or the Kähler form to the fiber, you get um, zero. Uh, so in fact, more than just being Lagrangian, these fibers also satisfy something called special Lagrangian. Um, so this big omega, which is our holomorphic, it's an N0 form. So it's a complex N form. So if the torus is also N dimensional, so it's volume form, you know. So, so, so basically, if you restrict this holomorphic volume form to the torus, you'll get something top dimensional. So it's going to be some complex number times the volume form. And if that complex number has fixed constant phase, then we say it's a special Lagrangian. So in this case, both of these torus fibers are special Lagrangian. Um, in this case, the phase is n pi over 2. Um, and special Lagrangians are a special case of calibrated submanifolds, which means that they are absolute minimizers for area. So um, that's one reason we like them. So you know, you're solving a minimal surface equation. Um, and that's one reason why we'll use the mean curvature flow to help us find them. Uh, sorry, just a notational question. What is, uh, so in this case, they're both n pi over two. What is n? Oh, the dimension of my base. Right, so I guess because this 
this is just, um, in this case, it's just dx plus i dy. So because the fibers are only in the y direction, you're just going to get i to the n, basically. Okay. And uh, a generic fiber is a uh, torus, but not all fibers are tori. I mean, there are some singular fibers as well. Um, in the in for general Calabria manifolds, certainly. Um, right now, this is just like my simple model case where you just take right. a, a tangent bundle and quotient it. But certainly, mm -hmm. we will have sing there. There are singular fibers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess that question gets at the main point: is like you know this is a baby model, but you know, is there some is there some natural thing about this construction? Do do all Calabria manifolds have some sort of similar structure? So we don't really know, um, but it is a conjecture. Um, so what physics uh, physicists noticed is that there's pairs of Calabi-Yau manifolds that, that give the same string theory. Um, I don't really do sim don't do string theory, so I don't know what that means. But I do think that it gives some nice conjectures on just understanding the geometry of calabi manifolds. So that's the way I like to view this. So. The conjecture is, is not necessarily saying that Calabi-Yau manifolds exhibit this structure, but perhaps near some degenerations, they will. Um, and so the conjecture is that, you know, if you have a mirror pair of calabi -Yaus near some degeneration, which I don't want to get into, um, there will be dual special Lagrangian torus vibrations over a base. And the base will have an integral affine structure. Um, so one way to think of dual is that the, the volumes of the fibers are inverses. Uh, yeah, and of course there can be singular fibers. That's part of the conjecture um, that there will be singular fibers as well. Um, so in addition to these torus vibrations, there'll be some local diffeomorphism that takes the moduli space of complex structures on one and gives you the complexified Kähler module. So this, this is the conjecture. Um, you know, people have been studying this for more than 20 years. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, there's not so many results, uh, special Lagrangian torus vibrations. Um, instead, uh, the most of the work has been on um, homological side. Like, so there's, there's lots of other conjectures that were, that you know, relate categories, derive categories of coherent sheaves on one to like Bukaya categories on the other. Um, so it's much more, you know, there's a lot of work on, on this aspect of mirror symmetry. Um, but we wanted to, to look at the actual you know, special Lagrangian vibrations. So that's what we did on a pair of non-compact Calabi out surfaces. Um, okay, so that's, that's the background section of the talk. Um, so let me introduce the two surfaces that we are dealing with, um, if there's no questions. Oh, yeah, I actually have a question. Is this talk a 50 minute talk or do I go to nine? Or uh, it's about 50 minutes talk. Yes. 50 minutes with, okay, with questions after. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I stop at the right spot. Um, okay, so, so it, we start on one, one of our surfaces is a Del Pezzo surface, which is projective uh, complex with ample anti-canonical bundle. Um, and so if you choose an anti-canonical divisor, then if you work away from that, the canonical bundle will be trivial. And so it will admit a non-vanishing holomorphic section. All right, so the idea is that, you know, the canonical, so this, um, so the anti-canonical bundle will admit, sorry, the canonical bundle will admit a section <laughs> um, omega check that has poles precisely along D hat or D check. So if you remove D check, then um, you have something that's non-vanishing, which means that working away from D check, we have a non-compact Calabi-Yau and by a theorem of Tian-Yau, it admits a complete Ricci flat metric. Okay, so this is going to be one of our calabi manifolds. Um, and our first theorem uh, from a few years ago was, in this case, we can find a special Lagrangian torus vibration. Um, 
And we'll see a little bit more later on what I mean by like why choosing a loop matters. But uh, the way to think about this is that, you know, this complete Ricci flat metric has an end where you think of um, the D check as being somewhere infinity along the end of this manifold. Um, and so let me write it like this. So here's my D check. So you think of this as being at infinity. And so close to infinity, this just looks like a, like topologically a cylinder times D check, although you know, it might not have cylindrical volume growth, but at least topologically, we can write it like this. And so then the idea is that if you have some loop on D check, right? So any simple closed loop there, and then you also get some loop here coming from the S1, then this will make a torus. And so it's like the choice of the loop and the choice of this S1 here will allow us to, to construct a special Lagrangian torus vibration based off of this initial loop. So that's um, why I did that. A question. So, um, so in particular, you're assuming that D-check has a non-trivial uh, H1. Yeah, it could, it I, I want to... Yeah, I want to, in particular, assume D-check is a nice smooth torus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I should have said that. I should have said smooth. Did I not say smooth? I'll just say smooth. Yeah. Um, OK. Oh, no, sorry, no, my, what I was trying to get at is not smoothness, but um, if it's topologically trivial. So it might not yeah. have a H1. OK, yeah, so definitely topologically trivial. Yeah. OK, um, so that's one side. Um, the other side that we have is a rational elliptic surface. So um, a rational surface is something that's birational to P2. And so we're going to assume you have something like that that admits an elliptic vibration. Um, and that elliptic vibration needs have a section um, and also assume that there exists a singular fiber of type IK um, of the Codera classification of the fibers. Um, so it's a wheel of K rational curves. Um, I have a picture of one in a little bit. Um, so again, you can see that if you remove this divisor, then you also get a non-combat Calabia. And in this case, Hein and his thesis constructed complete Ricci flat metrics. Um, he actually constructed complete Ricci flat metrics on lots of um, rational elliptic surface minus different divisors of different singular type. Oh, I was being too still and my lights turned off. <laughs> it's not seeing me. Oh, I guess you, I'll give a talk. It'll be a little bit darker. Um, Right, so we use a slight generalization of his construction. Um, and so what we prove in this case, again, we prove the existence of a special Lagrangian torus vibration. Um, I'm going to include just a little more in the statement of our result because um, we also had to work hard to get a uniqueness result in this case. Um, so we have a rational elliptic surface. We have the singular fiber of that type. Um, we let the ought zero be the automorphisms that preserve the fibers and are also homotopic to the identity. Um, then we can find a Ricci flat metric asymptotic to the semi-flat Kähler metric. So the finding of this is close enough to the work Hein did, um, but then we show it's unique modulo um, this group. So you also get a special Lagrangian torus vibration with respect to this Ricci flat metric. Um, and you can construct a mirror map so that the vibrations, that the, the one that we did last time, is mirror to this one. Um, so. Yep, so that's the main result that I want to talk about. I can leave it up for a second. I can try to turn my light on again. <laughs> the sensor must not be working so well. 
Okay. So, so one thing I should say is that, you know, we didn't just choose this a hat. Um, this is a, this homological mirror symmetry between these two services has been worked out and quite well understood. So it's sort of like the natural thing to do, you know, to try it in a case where we know that things have been worked out in the homological case. So um, you can prove the derived category of coherent sheaves on one side, it's equivalent to the Fukai category on the other. Um, you can prove the Hodge diamonds or mirror. Um, so there's been plenty of work done in this direction before. Uh, I should also say that, you know, people who work on Kalabi Yaos and non-complex Kalabi Yaos, you know, uniqueness questions have definitely been around for a while. So um, we were able to at least show that we get some nice uniqueness um, under the assumptions that we have this convergence to this metric at infinity. All right, so let me talk a little bit about how to prove um, the existence of the special Lagrangian vibrations, which I think is what I'm going to focus on uh, today. Um, so the first thing we want to do is look at, you know, how do the Ricci flat metrics behave near these singular fibers? Um, so if you understand that model geometry, then in the model geometry, you can find uh, families of special Lagrangians. And because the model geometry is, you know, because our Ricci flat metrics converge to the model geometry exponentially fast, um, you can pull these special Lagrangians back to plain old Lagrangians with respect to your Ricci flat metric, um, although they may no longer be special Lagrangians. So you get these Lagrangians and they're close to special Lagrangians, close enough that you can use the mean curvature flow to flow them back into Lagrangians. I'm sorry, back into special Lagrangians. So then they're actually um, minimal. Um, and so once you found a single special Lagrangian, then we use the fact that this is a complex um, surface or a Calabi-Yau surface. So we're allowed to use um, a different complex structure where these special Lagrangians become uh, holomorphic. So they become, it becomes an elliptic vibration. And then once you have an elliptic vibration, we can argue that it actually extends over all of X and X check. So especially steps four and five use very heavily that we're in the surface case, the calabi surface case. See, and now the light turned on and I wasn't even moving, so. <laughs> May I, uh, if it's not important, you can uh, skip it for now, but I was just wondering if you can say a word about uh, step four and uh, how a hypercalar rotation would uh, give a vibration. Oh, yeah, I, I certainly will. Um, I guess I can, we'll see if I get there at the end actually, but what I can say right now is that um, so the hyper the hypercalar rotation. So we'll definitely see how that can give you a, a elliptic curve, right? So you have a special Lagrangian with respect to one complex structure. You use a different complex structure where it's holomorphic, um, and we also have some small. You know, all special Lagrangians have some small uh, unobstructed moduli space, so you can al always deform it in a small open set. Um, so then you need to do an open closed argument. So we always have openness. And then the point is we need to get closed. So then for closed, you look at sequences of elliptic curves. And then therefore there's like a lot of compactness theories for if you have a sequence of elliptic curves and then ruling out like if a sequence converges to some elliptic curve with this, you know, structure, you know, singular elliptic curve with this structure, you can rule that out for this reason, stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, that was clear. Okay. So that's sort of the overview. I probably won't make it further than three or maybe a little bit of four, um, but uh, you know, oh, I want to make sure what I'm talking about is clear instead of just trying to go fast. Um, great. So let's start off with the local model for the Ricci flat metric on the Del Pezzo minus D check. Um, so this model is called the Calabi model. He's the first one to explore this um, model space. 
So what you do is you, you look at D check, which is going to be like the infinity in the model, and you choose a holomorphic line bundle over it of degree K. Um, and so basically we can get a map from D check to actually see quotient lattice. And let me, for this talk, um, just assume that the lattice tau is I, it just will make my formulas look prettier instead of being longer. Um, and I will choose complex coordinates on D check. Um, and so, okay, so you get a flat Riemannian metric on D check um, coming from the curvature of a metric on L. So I'm going to look at the tubular neighborhood of the zero section. So this will be, you know, the topological space of the Calabi model. And I will put a complex structure and metric on it. Um, so here's how you write down the um, Kähler form on the Calabi model. So, um, right, so, you know, here's L. So this length, we can think of L is going to be some measure of, you know, getting, going towards, so as, as you head towards the zero section, L goes to infinity. Um, and so, you know, with the de definition of L, then omega J looks maybe a little bit more manageable. We have here, this is just the flat Kähler metric on the D check. And then we have an L direction and then a direction theta, which is going to be like in the S1 um, that's left over. Uh, and in fact, if you're familiar with something called the Gibbons Hawking onsets, you can say, okay, yeah, well, here is my Kähler form, but there's a natural complex structure on my space. So what is the Riemannian metric? Well, it looks exactly like this, which is oops, in the form of the Gibbons Hawking onsets. So, um, so if that's something you're familiar with, you'd see, maybe nice to see what the metric is on this space. Um, let me actually give a complex coordinate on L that'll just allow me to write down the, the holomorphic volume form. Um, again, maybe it's not so special in terms of understanding what this means, except just notice that as L goes to infinity, then um, the holomorphic volume form also goes to infinity. So it has a pole on the zero section. So it has a pole. Um, um, yeah, right on D check. So this is going to be the model for our holomorphic volume form coming from uh, Y minus D check. Okay, so this is sort of our like little model space that's going to be uh, what our Ricci flat metric is asymptotic to. Um, and in this space, we can write down a uh, torus vibration just by looking at L being constant and um, C1, which is what the real part of my complex coordinate on D check being constant. And you can see that there's special Lagrangians. Um, so we get a special Lagrangian vibration. Um, so I gave a version of this talk over the summer where I had a little more free time to draw pictures. Um, so I drew a little picture that maybe helps understand it a little better. So here's my coordinates, um, psi of one and psi two on the, on the base D check. Uh, and if you have psi one be constant and L be constant. So here was my, this is my line bundle, but I sort of drew it as like a cone just because, you know, I have this as L goes to infinity, you know, it goes, um, you have infinite distance, it's complete. The metric is complete. Um, so yeah, so L being constant and C1 being constant, I get these two lines and those are gonna be the, the special Lagrangian torus vibration. Okay. Um, so that's the picture here. And what I can show you now is, you yeah, know, just to um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, in the second fiber, what are the uh, uh, psi and uh, rho? So oh, are... I think this is still okay. So, so basically, um, so psi is going to be the angular coordinate, I guess I should mm -hmm. say that's right here. So psi is the angular complex coordinate on L on the on the line bundle. 
Um, and so there's a really, so basically both R and L you can think of as just being related. I think I wrote down the relation a little bit later. It's like R is like L to the minus two thirds or something like that. Um, yeah, so, psi, so you just think of psi as like the angular coordinate and L can be the distance. Like, yeah. Oh, that's an L, sorry, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Thank okay. <laughs> Maybe my handwriting in the picture was bad. No, no, have to. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me just show you a little bit about what, if you have never seen a hypercalar rotation, um, essentially what you do, um, Okay, so this C is just to make my formulas look a little prettier. Um, these symplectic forms, omega i and omega k, are the real and imaginary parts of the holomorphic symplectic and um, the holomorphic two zero form that I had on the previous slide. And so they form a hyperkähler triple, which um, essentially means that you have a fixed Riemannian metric G and you have three complex structures i, j, and k that satisfy the relations of the quaternions. Um, and these are all um, Kähler forms. So that's what a hyperkähler triple is. And so then what you can check and what you can see is that, okay, so omega j was my original Kähler form. And um, in this Kähler form, my torus vibration was special Lagrangian. However, what I could do is work with the Kähler form omega i and then in the Kähler form omega i, then I get a complex structure associated to it, i. And in that complex structure, the vibration is actually a vibration of elliptic curves. So it's a holomorphic vibration. Um, and then you get a holomorphic coordinate on the base of the vibration. So the leftover coordinates are l and psi one. So those are gonna be my base coordinates. So this is what I mean by do a hyperkähler rotation. You, you know, you get, you have these three um, you have these three Kähler forms, one, say the original Kähler form we had, the other two coming from the real and imaginary parts of your holomorphic N0 form. Um, and you can then choose, say, this is your Kähler form, you get a different complex structure, and then that switches your things from being special Lagrangian to um, elliptic curves. Okay, so I, I wrote down the holomorphic coordinate on the base. The fibers is actually a little tricky. You need to find a holomorphic section and like integrate because um, this theta is not exact. Um, let's just say you can do it for now. I don't want to write you know a bunch of pages of formulas. Um, but even just looking, so so you can you we had this holomorphic coordinate y on the base. Um, which I can use to just give me a coordinate Z on a unit disk. Um, knowing how the, this holomorphic section behaves, you can see what happens if we go around a loop in, in this disk. Um, and so we can see exactly how the vibration structure is. Um, you can just see that this ends up being the lattice and you say, okay, well, that's the standard model for an elliptic vibration with IK singularity at the central fiber. Um, so that's how we know we can go from like the picture of the del Pezzo to the rational elliptic surface, even just by looking explicitly at the model near infinity. Uh, so I'm sorry. Sure. Oh. Just because I don't want to miss this. Uh, uh, thank sure. you. Um, uh, sorry, I missed. What is Z? So because log Z is the main thing which uh, determines the the tau parameter of your elliptic curve. So I just want to make sure I understand what log what Z is. Oh, so yes, of course. So so this. Let me just go back. So Y is the holomorphic coordinate on the base. So right. it comes from L and psi one, and you can even see in this picture that I had. So um, if you just you know L and psi one is going to be the base of a vibration that I drew dark red here. Um, yeah. So that actually is just the holomorphic coordinate on the base of this vibration. And Z is just E to that. You just exponentiate it. Uh, it's OK. Yes, got it. Yeah. Just to put, basically, instead of having a, I don't want to work on a cylinder, I want to work on a punctured disk. That's, that's all Z is. Um, Thank you. Sure, of course. Um, 
so here's my little picture of this is my IK singular fiber. Um, so you can see like, you know, away from the center, we always get nice new elliptic curves, but then as you get close to the center, you know, pinches off in a cycle K times. Um, okay, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the model of the rational elliptic surface. I think based on what I already said, you get some idea, um, but... Um, by in the way, that, sorry for uh, no, interrupting please. so much. But uh, in the last slide, um, uh, do you know what the monodromy is of uh, going around the singular fiber? The monodromy, yeah, I think it's uh, one like k. Is that right? One zero k, k zero one something like that. I it, I mean okay. You're telling me the two by two matrix, I guess. Yeah. Okay. What is it again? Sorry, I didn't get. I think it's one k zero one. I think that's the model. One k zero. Okay, and I mean the important. Okay, so it has the right form, but the important thing is k is it's k dependent. That's yeah. What, thank you. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, please stop me. I mean, I'm I'm happy to give as many, answer as many questions as I want. It's like you know, so the last talk of the year should be informal and a nice discussion. Um, yeah, um, let me see. Okay, so, right, so we have the, this picture of the rational elliptic surface minus the singular fiber. Um, if you're familiar with this sort of thing, this is what the model semi-flat metrics looks like. Um, if not, don't worry about it. It's not going to be that necessary later in the talk. Suffice it to say that you could just believe me when I say this omega i that we had last time from the hyperkähler rotation a few slides ago fits perfectly with the standard model semi flat matrix. So you know that you're doing the right thing. Um, yeah, if you've seen this, I mean, I think I first learned about it in the paper of Gross Wilson, but um, I think it's been the model semi flat metric has been in earlier stuff too. But um, yeah, so it's, it's a familiar form if you've worked with it before. Um, okay, so in this model, it's a little harder compared to the Kabi model to find the special Lagrangian torus vibration. Um, so um, the point is that, you know, so, so we need to find two S1s and then we need to make sure that what we get is a special Lagrangian. So the first S1 is, okay, just take a loop around the, uh, take a loop in the base around the central fiber. Okay, so that's fine. Um, for this, then we write down these things called bad cycles. Um, so these are going to be cycles in the fiber um, where the imaginary part is going to be equal to this fixed thing. Um, so it's theta here, oh, I should probably shouldn't have used theta as the angle coordinate because I had theta as an earlier coordinate. Sorry. So this is a different theta than the one before. This is just the angle coordinate in the base. Um, so as you go around, you know, this cycle in the fiber might, is going to shift. Um, the only one that is easy enough to check to special Lagrangian is where m is zero. So this is actually, you just take the imaginary part of x is zero. Remember, x is the co holomorphic coordinate on the fibers. Um, so you can check that you get a special Lagrangian of phase pi over two in this case. Um, and if you want to have these other m's, you get special Lagrangians respect to a different semi-flat metric, which would be like translation by a holomorphic section of the vibration. Um, but at least for this talk, let's just take um, the special Lagrangian to be um, this cycle C0. Okay. So here's a picture if you want. So here's my base Z coordinates, but then now here my rho and theta are going to be the distance and angle coordinates in Z. And then here's my lattice. And here's the imaginary part of X equals zero. That's gonna be the other S1. So that is gonna give me a special Lagrangian. Okay, so we have have these two models. So, so these two models aren't giving me my exact Ricci flat metric, but you know, the, the Ricci flat metrics that are constructed in one case by Tian Yao and the other case by Hein 
do converge exponentially to these models. So um, we have, that's, okay, that's what I just said. So, <laughs> so we have the Ricci flat metrics as some methodically approach these models. And you can use a Moser trick to flow the Lagrangians in the model metrics to actual Lagrangians with respect to the Ricci flat metrics. Um, they will no longer be special Lagrangians. Um, but because of exponential decay, they will be close. Um, so I actually, I changed, instead of working with L, I think in this part, we decided it was easier to work with the distance R down the ends. Um, it, this way it matched a lot better with a lot of previous work on, <laughs> in these settings. Um, okay, but suffice it to say, we have each one has an end and we have some distance down the end and the metrics converge asymptotically in R or exponentially in R to the model metrics. So what happens is you, you just have to be careful. Okay, you write down this Lagrange, this special Lagrangian in each model metric. And we sort of need to understand the geometry in each model metric and then see like, okay, if we know the geometry in each model metric, then if you then look at what happens if you look at a metric that's exponentially decaying to the model, what happens to each of the main geometric things or the um, main geometric objects associated to the Lagrangians. So you can see like, how does their second fundamental form decay in R? Um, the mean curvature, of course, for the special Lagrangians on the model was zero. So when you look at the mean curvature of the transplanted Lagrangian, then that's going to decay exponentially. Um, the volume will be bounded. Um, um, there's some non-collapsing thing. Uh, and you can look at the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the Lagrangian. So these, these end up being important in the argument for when the mean curvature flow converges. All right, so this just comes, so these all come just from you know, explicitly looking at the geometry in the model. Um, and then knowing that you're gonna get something pretty close if you have an exponentially decaying metric to the model. Okay, so then we just came up with a little term to say like, you know, all of the, the Lagrangian behaves in this way. Okay, so let me maybe talk a little bit about mean curvature flow now. Um, so the idea of mean curvature flow is, if you haven't seen it before, you have some um, sub-manifolds sitting inside of a Ramanian manifold. There's a mean curvature vector. And what we do is you just deform the sub-manifold in the direction of the mean curvature vector. The idea is that, you know, maybe one day that flow will converge and it will give you a actual minimal surface. Um, so if you've studied mean curvature for a little bit, you notice that things go wrong all the time. So you'll start flowing and, you know, maybe this is in R3 even, you know, there's, if you have some surface that looks like this dumbbell and you flow it by mean curvature flow, then the neck could pinch off. And so you get some singularity and you say, okay, I have to stop. Um, so for the Lagrangian mean curvature flow, um, again, that it's just doing mean curvature flow if you happen to start with a Lagrangian. So you, you check that the mean curvature flow preserves the Lagrangian condition. Um, and again, you'd like to hope that it converges to some special Lagrangian. Uh, now, singularities can still happen, um, but in this case, because we know the mean curvature vector can be tiny, then we actually get convergence. So that's sort of the, the point here. Um, we have to use that very explicitly, our bounded geometry. It's sort of our only hope. Otherwise, yeah, probably you get singularities all the time. Okay, so we start off with this. Sorry. Yeah. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so you claim so the uh, the fact is that the mean curvature flow does preserve the Lagrangian uh, property. Does it also so in terms of topology, does it preserve the homology class of the submanifold as you flow it? Yeah. 
mm -hmm. um, until you get a singularity. Until um, the, the, yeah. yeah, right. So in fact, what I think the most important thing for, right, for the mean curvature flow is that, you know, it preserves, so every Lagrangian in this complex manifold is you're able to measure its phase. So it's special Lagrangian of this e to the i theta is actually some constant theta. Mm -hmm. But of course, any Lagrangian, you can measure it against the holomorphic volume form and get that you're some complex function times the volume. So, so you get a phase. Um, and so the most important thing is that the Lagrangian mean curvature flow doesn't disturb, like it preserves the cohomology class of D of that phase. Right, so because if we want that to have a special Lagrangian, the phase should be constant. So D of that phase should be zero. So we need, you know, that to be preserved. So that's called the, the Maslow class. So that is preserved along the mean curvature flow. So we start off with something with zero Maslow class, and that should, you know, stay zero Maslow class, and then hopefully converge to something where the theta is actually zero. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so, you know, when you start a new flow, you have to learn how to compute everything. So <laughs> you write down in local coordinates, you know, all of your curvature terms, associated with curvature terms, how does the metric change? How does the embedding change? How does the mean curvature one form change? Um, so then you, you get a formula like this, um, which allows you to see how does the L2 norm of the mean curvature vector integrate it? over the Lagrangian change. So you get this formula and you say, okay, well, I want something exponentially decaying. That's the only hope I'm gonna get for this thing converging. Um, let's make a little sense about this term with the negative sign in front of it. Um, see what hope we have. Um, oh, so here's what I was saying about the Maslow pass. Um, basically, it means that it starts off a function and um, you can actually compute the mean curvature one form by taking the derivative of this function. Um, so because it's a function, I can write it down in the orthonormal basis of L2 for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian and just doing a little manipulation. This is sort of like trivially writing things down you can see that this term, which was the derivative of the mean curvature one form is actually um, the Laplacian of theta squared. Um, and then just using the eigenfunctions, um, we can see, okay, cool. So we're going to get a lower bound by the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian times the L2 norm of the mean curvature. Um, Okay, so using that, we end up with this formula. And so now you think like, okay, so maybe now we get some hope of getting exponential decay. Um, we would love for this whole thing here to inside of the parentheses to be positive so that the right-hand side is negative. Um, so at first you might be a little bit dispirited <laughs> because as R goes to infinity, this you can check the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on these Lagrangians actually goes to zero. Um, but luckily it goes polynomially, um, whereas H goes exponentially. So, um, so the key for us in terms of getting convergence was to show that this, this condition we called bounded geometry, which is like all of the essential curvature terms satisfy these bounds, whatever that may be. Um, that's preserved along the flow, like that doesn't mess up. So it's sort of like getting effective estimates on all these things. Um, and then once you have that, then you know that H times A is always much smaller than lambda one all along the flow. So then you actually do get this exponential decay. Um, so yeah, proving these effective estimates is sort of the key of the mean curvature flow part of the paper. Um, okay, so you get L2, um, exponential decay. And then there's some, you know, if you remember, I talked about something non collapsing. Um, if you're familiar with these types of like Ricci flow or mean curvature flow, like non collapsing things show up. Um, so here's the 
here's the point of the non-collapsing. Um, it allows you to say that if you have an L2 bound and it's, you can get actual C0 decay. So that's why we need the non-collapsing to be preserved. So you get pointwise decay with H. And then from there, you can get convergence. Um, I see I basically have two minutes left. So just for fun. Um, right, so we get convergence. That's cool. Uh, what's one thing that's cool is that if you have this control of the mean curvature vector now, point-wise, we know that the mean curvature flow can't move your Lagrangians too far. So if you actually, if you space them out enough, then they'll stay just, just joint along the flow. So um, it's not necessarily that useful for our work, but you can get a countable family, which is kind of cool, going out along the ends of your manifold. Um, so then in the last minute, I should say, um, how do we get a vibration? Um, so there's a local vibration. So this is a, a theorem, a deformation theorem of McLean. Um, so you get a local vibration. So as soon as we get one special Lagrangian, we get a local vibration on the known deformation theory. Um, and then here's our vibration theorem. Maybe I'll just end with the statement of it since I won't be able to talk too much about the proof. But um, so we have some assumptions on the geometry of our ends, which is satisfied for the two examples of the del Pezzo and the rational elliptic surface. Um, if you have those assumptions, then, you know, if there exists a special Lagrangian torus, then there gets a vibration. And there's at most, you know, the Euler characteristic of X singular fibers. So, uh, so I just for uh, what is inch? Where? Um, oh, the injectivity radius. That's the injectivity radius. Radius at point X. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll stop here because I don't I don't want to go over my time. Uh, uh, Adam, you, you, you are sure you don't want to comment a little bit more about this last statement? Oh, I, uh, I mean, I'd be happy to. I just figure it's the last. No, 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 no. Take a bit more time, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so basically what you do is, um, maybe just in a few minutes, you basically change complex structures so that you now get holomorphic vibration, at least locally. Um, and you look at the moduli space of I holomorphic curves um, that are homologous to your Lagrangian. Um, but we, we don't, J doesn't necessarily need to be fixed. It just needs to be holomorphic in I. Uh, because of course, we want the complex structure of our elliptic vibration. That's going to change. Um, OK, so, um, so we look at these spaces. And um, it's this space X1 is going to be open by the deformation lemma. And we need to show that it's closed, right? So you need to classify. So basically, we have to take sequences of fibers, or I mean, sequences of points in this modular space. And show that you know, like you could get elliptic singular elliptic curves, but there's only going to be finitely many, and the ones you end up with are classified. Um, so let's see here. So so basically, the the key tool is going to be the there's already a compactness theory for holomorphic curves. So if you choose a point in the boundary, you know, like where there might be some singularity. Um, you know kind of what it looks like, right? Like it's going to be some cusp curve. Um, I mean, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> how much details I want to go into now. But um, basically, you show that, you know, we can rule out by, by basically like, 
Um, let's see. You, you show that these are different fibers of different Cordera type, and then you rule out accumulation points by bounds on the Euler class. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just say that. I think that this is fine for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions or, or, or remarks? Um, just a remark. Um, can, so how much of this can be done? Let's say if you uh, assume that your uh, Calabi hour is defined over Q or some uh, number field. Ooh. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. Um, I that that might be a little bit beyond my knowledge. Um, the the problem the problem is that um, some uh, things like mean curvature flows and other uh, Riemannian geometry concepts are well, difficult to imagine what they might mean or what they might be in a uh, arithmetic setting. So, possibly, yeah. Um, so I mean, one thing we would say is someone mentioned this too, like. There's no reason we had to use mean curvature flow. Um, yeah. uh, essentially, we you have a special Lagrangian in the model. You just need to, when you pull it back onto your Ricci flat metric, you need to deform it slightly to get an actual special Lagrangian again. Um, so you, maybe there's versions of the implicit function theorem or other types of other types of ways to get this. Um, Again, the key for us is you needed to have these estimates be like effective in terms of like, you know, as you go down the tube, we don't want the geometry to get messed up too much. Um, yeah, so maybe the mean curvature flow doesn't have to be a part of it. I don't know if in other settings you can use implicit function theorem and stuff like that for <laughs> the um, other fields. That's something that's just sort of beyond my knowledge, but. Yeah, certainly you might not need mean curvature flow, but you need some notion of how to deform. So if you know how to do that, whatever that may be. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And so from the examples you obtain, uh, I mean, where you, 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 you check basically uh, the conjecture, can you build a higher dimension uh, uh, manifold which would satisfy the, the conjecture? Uh, you know, so. Building on them? The problem with higher dimension, I haven't thought about it too much. The problem with the higher dimension is that you can't do the hyperkähler rotation. So then you don't, you can't use the Sachs Uhlenbeck compactness. So, so I'm not sure, like, so, so one thing I am thinking about is can you at least find one special Lagrangian in higher dimensions. I think that's something something we're like thinking about right now. I'm not sure how to use, you know, what we did to get to higher dimensions to get a whole vibration. Maybe there's some other ways we can do that. We just haven't thought about it yet. Um, at least even trying to get one special Lagrangian isn't the easiest. Um, also, for, I, in the in the surface case, I think uh, so. Uh, this Kodaira classification of uh, uh, the singular fibers, I mean, you use that right at the end, that might not be available in uh, higher dimensions. Yeah, certainly. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is one reason why many people study homological mirror symmetry. <laughs> because, you know, outside of the surface case, dealing with vibrations is very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think if there is no extra question, or maybe Stephen. Oh, yeah. you. Thank you, Adam. Um, um, I'm, I just uh, sort of uh, want to understand it more deeply the, this question of uh, mirror symmetry that somehow, somewhat, I mean, the conjecture depends on going to a you know, large volume or large complex mm -hmm. yeah. limit. And, uh, you know, why do people expect that? And, and uh, why do you, I mean, th does it ever happen that you don't have to go to a large volume? Large? I mean, for, for us, we do. So let me go, if I can go all the way back to our theorem. 
So for us, what I mean by the large complex structure limit or large volume plus structure limit is, wow, well, it's really, come on. Here we go. This here, right? So it won't work if um, you don't get uniqueness or I actually know we can't even solve the Ricci flat metric. So this actually shows up even in Heinz work. Um, you don't even get a Ricci flat metric unless um, you know the fibers look really small. So that's just part of the, the way that the existence works. I mean, you can see you know, in the existence theorem where it shows up. Um, so that's, I think, on our side of things. Um, you know, where it comes up. I would say that, you know, generally, let's see, now I'm trying to think. If you look at like Fermat hypersurfaces, like quintics or Clavier quintics or something like that, with three folds, um, basically that's one case where you can see like, can you deform it into, um, shoot. Now I'm trying to remember exactly the setup. I don't remember exactly the setup. I saw that Yang Li talked about mirror symmetry earlier on <laughs> in your seminar. I think maybe he talked, did he talk about the quintics? Like you have like some specific setup to the large complex structure limit. Um, yeah, why? So, so I mean, is your question, I, I, I guess I would say to answer your question, in examples, I can see why you need it. You need to like look to some deformation um, to see that there's a vibration study, a vibration structure, and then know that, okay, maybe near this deformation, we can go back. Um, as for why it's necessary, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know if it was originally part of this, the SYZ conjecture. I think originally they just said like, can you, you just have pairs of clavios, like go for it you get these, this, this vibration structure. And then it sort of became clear that like only in these like degenerations could you, you know, have any hope of seeing any, anything like that. In, in, in higher dimensions, um, are there examples where these things uh, can be worked out? Um, not that I know of, of special Lagrangian vibrations. No, um, I think that there's Lagrangian vibrations, um, but yeah, I don't know. I should say I'm not an expert in X Y Z. S Y Z. You know, I'm more. I, I mean, I was more brought onto this to do the Romanian geometry stuff. But um, you know, I'm happy to talk to Yushan about it, and he's he's definitely was the driving force behind that part of things. But um, I, mean, I think uh, I mean mo most people who work in uh, mirror symmetry and you know other aspects have very little faith in this uh, you know large complex structure limit type. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I think that that's true, um, and that's why part of me says things like you know I'm not necessarily even like so much interested in the mirror symmetry and more just into like you know. Look, we have an existence theorem for a Ricci flat metric of, on Calabi-Yau manifolds, but we don't even really know, like, what does it look like, right? You know, like, so maybe just any understanding of what the structure of calabi metrics, I think is cool and right. interesting to me. So, you know, if in this case, you can see that it has this, like, this vibration structure, like, that's, that's I think that's great. Um, Maybe in higher dimensions you can't, but maybe there's something else we can do to understand what Calabi-Yau metrics look like. So, uh, about this uh, uh, smallness, I mean this infinity limit. Uh, when you write uh, that this has to be sufficiently small, there is no even a conjecture about effectivity of how much small it must be, right? Um, Not even a conjecture. I'm saying. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean. Yeah, in this particular case, I think you just, we have, you like write down an integral and then you just say like, you know, there's some parameters and then that integral needs to be positive for it to work. So you just make sure that like 
this parameter is sufficiently small, but I don't think, I don't know if there's anything like geometric in it. I think it's just something we can do as long as this is small enough. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, I think it's time to, 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 to thank the speaker, except if there are extra yeah. comments or questions. <laughs> Thank so you. Nobody is writing hands. So I think it's time. Okay. okay so sure. <laughs> let's yeah. clap virtually at least. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, have a thank good you. Day.